So greetings and welcome everyone to another episode of Oral Pathology 360. And today we have a very interesting topic and it's on diagnostics. It's really very important because as you know, you know, sometime back, um, a few years back, I guess, we had this interesting news that uh, OPG, the autopantomograph, would show the uh, presence of uh, carotid artery calcifications or ateromas. Now, this was very interesting because, of course, if someone had not known that they had one and it was incidentally found on an OPG, it was very great. In the same way, finding other oral uh, manifestations or normal features that would change to show other systemic diseases is very interesting because, of course, we do get patients to come to us for regular checkups, uh, preferably once a year. So if we can just incidentally find these and make a difference to the patient's life, uh, I think that's a very great thing. And that is what we have today. If it's your first time here, I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue. I'm the founder director of Oral Pathology 360, where we have grown, of course, beyond the original topic. Now we include oral medicine, oral radiology, and always, as always, of course, anything in diagnostics of oral and maxillofacial lesions. Now, some of you are logging in from LinkedIn and some are logging in from Facebook. So I request you, if you would like to have access to our many videos, now those are only available on our YouTube channel. If you scan this uh, QR code later on, you can go directly to the channel. And uh, of course, I, it's also the link is there in the description and almost everywhere else. So with that, let me say hello and let me bring in our guest. Yes, our guest for today, Professor Geronimo Lazarus from Argentina. Very welcome, and it's wonderful to have you with Thank us today. You. Great to, to be here. Thanks for the invitation again. You're most welcome. Right, I think with this, let me first just check and see if there are any comments. Well, not so far. Mm -hmm. People have logged in, but there are no comments. So we will just uh, start the session. And as we go on, and as all of you uh, join in, Please remember any questions or comments you have, you can put in the live chat wherever you are. And uh, we will get to those after the session. Right now, we will play a recording of the lecture and then we will go on with the actual discussion. Right. See you on the other side. <laughs> okay. Hello, I am Professor Geronimo Lazos from Cordoba, Argentina. Uh, and I'm First and overall, I want to thank yet again, uh, Dr. Mandana Donoghi, the one and only responsible for the Oral Pathology 360 webpage and, their, and her continuous efforts to promote oral pathology and medicine among the world. So today I am going to talk, try to talk to you about oral varicosities and they're important, as you may find out, if you join me, their connection to systemic conditions. Oral varicosities represents a regular finding in the elderly population. Broadly speaking, since they usually pose no risks whatsoever for oral health, they are described as having little to no significance. However, oral OB, oral varicosities, have indeed been mentioned as an indicator of certain systemic conditions. They are as common as they are fully understood. So, in this lecture, I will try and give you a broad depiction of this frequent lesion and their potential use as markers of systemic health. Well, uh, here you have an overview of, of the all the topics we are going to, I am going to show you in the next few minutes. Okay, first one. Um, varicosities are considered an acquired benign lesions of vessels which become permanently dilated and tortuous. And within oral cavity, when we say varicosities, we usually, this term is only used in reference to venous lesions. 
varices of the ventral surface of the tongue represents a common oral finding. They have been given several denominations, including caviar tongue, flavectasia linguae, caviar spots, or lesions, lingual and sublingual varicosities. But uh, the most common term, the most common way of referring to them is, of course, oral varices, and that, that is the one that we are going to use up in this presentation. So when we say OB, we are going to refer to as oral varices or oral varicosities. So OB as regarded as a physiological process, uh, usually referred as not so much as a disease, but as a condition. That is a variation of the normal as uh, referred to by the, by the World Health Organization, because they are believed to be a development anomaly and OB are often discovered Incidentally, during a routine oral examination, uh, but they are seldomly recorded in the medical history of the patient. Also, OB are usually deemed insignificant. However, this is a very important point. However, oral varicosities are mentioned in association with several medical diseases. Caviar tongue is a widely used name to describe oral varicosities, and it has been given to OB uh, because of its typical feature of multiple round little bases of purplish blue color, as we can see here in the picture, um, resembling the salt cured roe or eggs from the beluga certugium. As you can see, the similarity is quite good. So, um, on the, oral, on the oral mucosa, the aging process induces a gradual and cumulative changes, and among them, oral varicosities are among the most common findings. Early studies studies by Dacosta and Kramer in the 1930s and Bean, the one we are seeing here in the slide uh, of 1952, found that the only correlation that was, was of the increasing Incident, that is, the only correlation was that oral varicosities increase its frequency with age. Um, <clears throat> a pioneer studied by Ettinger and Anderson of 1974 about sublingual varices is still to this day the one with the largest sample to date, having 1,751 patients enrolled. And these patients stated that a person with varicose veins of the legs is likely to have lingual varicosities. They also mentioned some, something that they call cardiopulmonary disease, but without stating which specific illnesses were encompassed by such denominations. Nonetheless, by this early age, the question was clear. Could oral varices be an expression of systemic conditions? If so, which ones? So we were, when we read this, we were curious. So we decided to delve deeper into the subject by doing a narrative review on the topic. Besides the apparent obvious conclusion that OB incidents rise with ages, as of 2013, the evidence supporting their relationship between OB and medical conditions was limited and somehow inconclusive. <clears throat> Sorry. Furthermore, there was a lack of consensus regarding its pathogenesis and what should be considered and what not should be considered a virus. So to say, the, the definition of what could be and should be considered a virus was not clear and was inconsistent among the different studies that treated and researched oral OB. So this warranted more research on the topic. So the first question that we must ask ourselves, what is exactly an oral varicosity? What could be considered an oral varicosity? A standard clinical criteria for oral lesions is always needed to avoid variability in the epidemiological research. 
So, as I was saying, the most important question is, what exactly is to be considered a nodal varicosity, an OB? Within the oral cavity, it is critical to understand that we define a venous varicose veins when we find them at the ventral surface of the tongue. There is an unanimous consensus concerning having this site affected to state that a given patient has oral varicosities. Having said that, varices OB can actually be found in many intraoral localizations and with variable degrees of extension. Hellstrom and Berg classify uh, so, uh, the oral varicosities and in which they call sublingual varicosities. They only refer to oral biases when they are talking about only the ventral surface of the tongue. So they classify them in two, non-few visible versus medium slash severe, only referring to lesions affecting this side and this side only. And so uh, another diagnostic criteria that uh, we proposed when we began to study oral varicosities is the one by our research group. We propose that OB are considered present in a given patient when the running vein is exophytic or has more than one main trunk more or more than three collaterals, so up to three collaterals is okay, it's normal. More than three could be considered positive for oral varices. Or this collateral having further ramifications. We are going to see some clinical segments in a minute, so don't worry if you feel confused right now. Or the third and um, most important, but at the same time, the most Obvious one, or when round ectasis are found, the, the so called caveal lesions that we saw just a minute ago. Another important part of the definition, when we, when we did our research on oral, oral varicosities, we found that the symmetry is an important key part of the definition. So, symmetry is to be considered when looking only at the ventral surface of the tongue exclusively. So usually when we when we assess the ventral surface, we in more than 90% of the cases we can see that one side has more lesions than the other. So we consider symmetry negative when a side, when a single side maybe that the left or the right has evidently more lesions. <clears throat> and remember, this is only referred when speaking about specifically the ventral surface of the tongue. <clears throat> Sorry. So in normal conditions, on each side of the running veins, see, could be seen as single symmetrical flat vessels usually inconspicuous, devoid of ramification, small and almost imperceptible. Almost, you, you, in usual conditions, you just could sense that there is the running vein, but you could not actually see. If you see this picture of a young patients, you could see that you can maybe see a slight bluish hue on the better surface of the tongue, but that's just it, nothing else. That is what could be considered normal. So, on the other hand, remember what we talked about symmetry. So, one of the main characteristics, one of the defining traits of oral varicosities is the presence of asymmetry. As you can see in the, in the picture, <laughs> When a side has more lesions, that side should also be rehearsed. So when you record the presence of oral OB, you should also ref 
record which site has more lesions. As you can see in this clinical picture, we have the, the right side who has more lesions in this particular front view. Here we have another clinical example when also the right side had evidently, at least in this view, more lesions. So remember, not only we have to record the presence of viruses, but we also have to write down the asymmetry or not. So this is, is these are some clinical examples of uh, oral viruses. Hmm? So in picture A, the one of the left upper corner, we can see a ventral surface of the tongue with more than one main trunk. As you can see in the arrows, the blue arrows, hmm? the main trunk of the ranin vein has uh, more than one trunk, and you can see it more clearly here on the right side of the patient. In picture B, we have the same case. This is the same patient as, as picture A, but here showing the left side with ramifications that were hindered in the frontal view. We are going to talk later on as to why this is really important when we assess a patient for OB to see the tongue, asking the patient to lift the tongue upwards and then to one side and then to the other, to see each side separately and to assess them to see exactly if we can see lesions or not. So picture C, left down, we can see more pronounced OB on the tongue with evident asymmetry. And even in this patient, we can see varicosities that could be also seen on the floor of the mouth, as you can, as you can see with the arrow that is signaling a varicosity near the osseum umbilical. So picture D is the same patient as C, showing that this patient has oral varicosities in other parts of the mouth, in this case, particularly showing oral OB on the buccal mucosa, along with some melanotic spots. So let's talk about the clinical features that uh, OB can have within oral cavity. So the ventral surface of the tongue is by far the most affected localization and usually in that place, the involved vessel is the lingual ranin vein. Remember, we say that a patient has oral varicosity because first and foremost, the ventral surface of the tongue is affected. Then after that, after identified, identifying viruses in that place, we go on and search in the rest of the oral cavity of any given patient. Yes? Besides the ventral surface of the tongue, floor of the mouth, buccal or labial mucosa, and other sites where are mentioned that could be affected by oral varicosities. But um, those four, four places, ventral surface of the tongue, floor of the mouth, buccal and labial mucosa are the most affected sites. Having said that, the lower lip vermilion can develop viruses, but in that specific place, oral varicosities are believed to be caused by chronic sun exposure. So the biological mechanisms behind the development of viruses in that particular location is different to all the other localizations. So we are going to make a separate note about them. When, we, when you see studies uh, on different research about oral varicosity, you will find out that they usually have an exclusion criteria, the uh, oral varicosities on the vermilion lip because precisely they are developed because of a different method. In this case, the UV exposition, the sun exposure of the patient is responsible for viral formation in that place. So, just uh, 
anything in the rest of the important features of OB. Varicocities are rare in infants, but however, are more common in adults over 50 years old with variable values, values, variable numbers are given in the literature. But the most recent studies, what with uh, large samples, are referring to a prevalence of approximately between 30 and 40, 46% <coughs> in patients over 50 years. Depending, of course, and this is important to remember, OB prevalence is strongly related on the age of the population. Contrary to variety of lesions of lower limbs, which are the most uh, common place of varices formation in the whole body, which are way, way more common in women, research on oral varicosities has shown a slight preference for men over all age groups. The enlarged veins sometimes could have, when the patient notice them by the first time, they go to the bathroom, they are brushing their teeth, and they, one day they decide to lift up the tongue and they see this war of blue, of violet, and they can be really frightened by that. And sometimes when the first, when the patients see the oral varicosities, particularly when they, they are really developing and in, and covering large areas of the ventral surface of the tongue, they may suffer from oncophobia. In some cases, but this is a situation that is not at all common, uh, some patients can develop glossodynia in association uh, with oral varicosities. In other occasions, if an oral varicosity is traumatized, they may produce a minor hemorrhage, although this, this is a really unusual situation. Occasionally, long-lasting OB could undergo secondary thrombosis and even calcification, a process what, that is called uh, the development of flavolites. In general, OB usually needs no treatment except for reassurance to the patients regarding its benign nature and in the really, really odd cases where they are uh, cosmetically, uh, they are, uh, they can be uh, in places such as we say most, most of them in the lip vermilion of, of, they could be not liked by the patient. So in that, in that particular occasion, in this two particular occasion when they are Pro, insights prone to trauma, or they are insight that the patient doesn't like to see them, a treatment may be considered. And in the rare occasions when we do treat an oral varicosity, the main type of treatment is the use of interlesional injection of various sclerosant agents. Okay, this is a box plot uh, depicting age in a study that we developed some, some years ago uh, that uh, this displaying a statistically significant difference between oral viruses, a group of patients with oral viruses with a sample of 672 patients, comparing the age, the mean age with the patient with the, the study group this was a group with patients having OB compared with a control group, that is patients devoid of oral varicosities. As you can see, the difference in mean age, both in males and females, is really different, and that difference has a statistically significant difference, uh, which shows that a OOB occurrence is increased as age increases. So when we talk about the differential diagnosis, there are uh, many lesions and many disorders that could look, uh, could look alike that 
to all of our ecosystems. So, OB may be confused with hymangioma, lymphangioma, Kaposi sarcoma, even melanoma, and some other disorders. However, most of these lesions can be properly differentiated by a thorough medical history and a detailed clinical evaluation. Also, with dioscopy, OB shows branching, which proves its vascular origin. So, dioscopy is useful to establish a differential di diagnosis with melanotic or purpuric lesions, we, which do not change coloration under pressure. Here you can see some photos. For example, the hemangioma, the photo of the on the right bottom, usually the vascular malformations such as hemangioma, the patient is aware that it's present on early ages, even, even at, when being children. So this, those lesions develop really slowly with time and can become bigger. And sometimes the patient, uh, such as this case here, uh, only six consultation with a specialist when the lesion is becoming so large that it's uh, alter the usual functioning of the mouth. But most of the cases, the, all of these uh, diseases that could look somewhat alike oral varicosis, uh, oral varicosis could be easily differentiated being really careful in uh, our clinical exam. So the proposed pathophysiological mechanism responsible for oral balises development uh, are still by and large an enigma to us. The dilatation changes may occur as a result of stimuli which do not have such pronounced effects in centrally located veins or in veins which have a firmer support. But within the oral cavity, if a high blood pressure in the arteriolas could be transmitted to the venulus, uh, such sustained increase in blood pressure, for that to happen, a prerequisite is having some kind of arteriovenous chance is needed for that. Uh, this hypothesis that is called the hemodynamic uh, hypothesis was proposed by a study by Solman and Ettinger, but it, yes, still to this day, yet to be proven. Also, there are some uh, particularities of the venous systems of the oral cavity, and particularly the one in the tongue that allows that uh, the vessels, the venous vessels, to dilate more easily. The ventral surface of the tongue has an anovalvular venous system where circulation is in favor of gravity, so the valves are not needed. Also, the vascular wire of the venous rain and the ramifications has have little to no muscle tissue. They also have scar supported connective framework and usually is also covered by a thin layer of mucosa, all of which makes for, for one, one thing, these vessels more prone to, to be delayed, dilated to venous dilatation at, at the same time, such engorged vessels, such engorged veins are more easily detected. This is a place in particular, as we say, in the vertical surface of the tongue, that the, the veins runs really close, almost touching the surface of the mucosa. So we can see it easily. And um, sometimes with some really minor changes to these vessels, we can already see it at early stages. But all in all, uh, the complete understanding of how the oral varicosity is developed is not yet knowledge, known. Okay, moving on to the one of the really key 
parts of a presentation. So uh, now we are going to speak about the systemic conditions and disorders and some others that have been mentioned in association with oral varicosities. In this first, first slide, what we call slide A, 3A, we are seeing the ones that have some kind of evidence of good quality research addressing the following medical status and disorders and its association with oral varicosities. The only undisputed factor is the relevance of aging for OB frequency. All the authors, all the books, all the textbooks that addresses in any way oral varicosities have a clear consensus that OB frequency increases as a person gets older. Also, there is a slight preference for males, but this is not uniform in the research. Some authors, such as uh, the studies but uh, our group, the studies but one of the most important groups for OB research, that's as a group from Sweden, from Hakan Berg and Leonard Hanstrom, also show that all varicosities tend to be more common in males, but the difference sometimes is not statistically significant. Another uh, systemic condition that are mentioned in association when all varicosities are what we call venous insufficiency, that is a patient who has varices in other places of the body, the more common place is lower limb varices, varices on the leg, so the early studies that I showed you by Ettingen and Madison with the largest sample of oral varices throughout the literature as today, 2023, uh, show consistently that uh, a, a person with uh, lower limb varices could have varices on the oral cavity. The family history of oral varices is, is important. Uh, it is a known fact that uh, the development of uh, venous varicosities has a important, an important hereditary part. So uh, to record, when we see a patient with oral varicosities, to record uh, and to ask the patient if a mother or her father have oral varicosities is really important. Another key disorder that is mentioned in relation to oral varicosities is what is called portal hypertension. That is the hypertension of the venous portal system, the system that is flowing through the liver. Uh, portal hypertension usually develops uh, secondary to liver cirrhosis, usually in alcoholics, uh, in patients with severe uh, hepatitis as a consequence of a severe form of hepatitis. Um, and last, last but not least, we have the, a broad group that is called the cardiovascular disorders. Uh, that in that group, we can, we can find uh, some heart problems. The congestive heart failure, that is the complete failure of the heart of pushing blood out, in and out of the, of the heart. And what is called, uh, let's say, um, not so common condition, what is called a pure right heart failure. So this, this, both, these both conditions could present, and they are described in medical textbooks as one of the key features to look for when we when a patient has a congestive or the right heart failure as, is to look for in venous ingurgitation and that are is has been described not in so many studies but at, there are at least four studies that describe uh, patients with this particular condition with 
uh, congestive or right heart failure, and oral varicosities. Also, another cardiovascular condition that is really important, that is uh, really common among the general population, is the uh, arterial hypertension. Oral varicosities has been mentioned has been mentioned as more common as a potential indicator as for arterial hypertension and also as an indicator for high blood pressure values, both for systolic and diastolic pressure. In addition, we have OB has been mentioned in relation to other factors, to other conditions. See? Yes, but, and this is a very important but, this is suggested because these, the following conditions don't have proper evidence to support the association or the research available today is not yet fully developed. With the only exception with the first four in this list, smoking. Smoking has been mentioned as a, a risk factor for varices development throughout the body. So, but in, within the oral cavity, there are a really only a few studies that addresses that, and their, their results are somehow we can close it, but uh, there are at least uh, one really good epidemiological study that mentioned the presence of, uh, relates the habit of, of smoking with oral varicosities. The second, diabetes, diabetes mellitus type two. This is, again, really important because diabetes is a type two is a, very common non-communicable diseases, disease that uh, affects a large part of the population uh, that has uh, the ability to produce a serious health, a myriad of health problems in a lot of patients. So, so the potential to use OB as an indicator of diabetes mellitus type two is could be a really, really important aspect for detecting these uh, conditions such as arterial hypertension, such, such as diabetes, which in the first stages may have no to slight symptoms so the patient can be unaware. So another condition that uh, has been mentioned uh, as able to develop uh, body cell lesions in other parts of the body is uh, women who have multiple pregnancies, that is more than two pregnancies. It is important to uh, note that uh, when we talk about uh, pregnancies and the possibility of developing viruses, this is uh, disregarding that the, that the women have or not uh, present or develop or not develop a preeclampsia. That is a condition that among other things produces an elevator blood pressure. So this is known to be associated with varicell development, but within the oral cavity, this has been seldom reported. Also, the use of uh, hormonal contraceptives have at least, at least one epidemiological good epidemiological study backing its relationship with oral varicosities. There are some other conditions Yes, conditions, uh, let's say more rare conditions that have been also mentioned, but uh, most of them uh, were uh, referred by uh, authors some more than 80, sometimes even 90 years ago, when maybe the uh, scientific literature was had more relaxed, let's say, uh, peer review. So the studies. Uh, lacks the proper scientific method to be reliable. But the, the condition that's called core pulmonale, that is a heart problem secondary to a pulmonary problem. And the reason behind this is uh, that core, core pulmonale finally tends to develop uh, what is called a 
a pure right heart failure. If you remember the last slide, right heart failure was a mentioned in relation to oral varicosity development. So uh, some of the authors have mentioned that uh, when, when a patient has a varices in other parts of the body, not only in the legs, but in the jejunum, in the scrotum, uh, in the thorax, in the arms, in pretty much any other locations, uh, that patient can also have varices within the oral cavity. Some other Yes, uh, very rare conditions such as the superior vena cava syndrome and uh, some other conditions that nowadays are at least uh, kind of rare as a chronic vitamin C deficiency uh, has been mentioned as, as in relation to, with oral varicosities. But besides the first four, all of the rest uh, have you have to take it with a grain of salt because the, everything, the evidence behind it is what, it, what we like to call eminence-based dentistry. That is in opposition to evidence-based dentistry. This is corpus monale, flavicase of the jejunion, superior vena cava syndrome, are in the list because some real important oral pathologies have been mentioned, but there are no studies, some proper study, that uh, addresses these specific topics. Well, just to show you one of the variables associating oral varicosities with arterial hypertension, this is part of the preliminary results of a case control study comparing the blood pressure values between patients with oral varicosities, the study group, and a control group that is patients without OB. In the study group, in the oral varicosity group, both systolic and diastolic pressure, blood pressure values were higher than in the control group. <clears throat> and that difference was statistically significant. Mm -hmm. As you can see, both systolic and diastolic pressure was more was higher in patients with oral varicosities. And this is a study with a really large sample, not as, as large as the study, but a Tinger and Madison, but coming close. So in the, in the same study, when the, log the logistic regression model was made, the association between oral varicosities and arterial hypertension was maintained and its statistical significance was, was good even when that relationship was adjusted for age, sex, having an old ratio of 36.64, which is a lot, which verifies the importance of such relationship, emphasizing the potential role of oral varicosities as a potential indicator of both high blood pressure and arterial hypertension. So now we are going to briefly see some examples of patients and how can the presence of OB can help us in identifying different medical disorders. So in order to illustrate its potential use in your clinic, in our clinical practice, one note, of importance, it is critical to note that the sole presence, the sole identification of oral varicosities is not enough to suspect medical diseases. So the interpretation should be done in a proper context, taking into account all the oral viruses that we know, that we mentioned that could affect varicell development and should be done doing a detailed and throughout medical history. A grading system of affected size uh, was developed to somehow assess extension and to better, to help to better correlate the oral viruses presence and extension. That is, 
more affected sites with the different systemic conditions. This isn't was development, but our research groups. And is it is like this. What we call grade one varices is a patient that has all of varicocytes only in the ventral surface of the tongue. So when we say grade one varices is that the patient has an oral varicosity. When we say grade zero, the patient have not. The grade two, the patient has some, is the same as G1, so ventral surface of the tongue affected, plus one side with oral varicosities. That is, that could be cal mucosa, left or right, labial mucosa, upper and inferior. See, and the, that should be recorded separately. So if the patient has an oral varicosity on the left buccal mucosa and also on the right, it should be recorded at two different places. So particles OB grade two is ventral surface of the tongue plus one side. <coughs> and lately, grade three, that is G1 plus two or more sites affected. For example, patient has paralysis on the vertical surface of the tongue, floor of the mouth, and labial mucosa. Thus, when a given individual has more affected sites, the more likely is that he or she has a medical condition or has a more advanced age. So to be precise, when a patient has less than 50 years, that's the usual cutoff point for the increasing incidence of oral varicosities. So when a patient has more than 50 years old and is presenting a grade two or more, the more likely is that that given patient have one or more of the conditions that we mentioned in relation to oral varicose development. And we should be careful and do a throughout medical history. So, a practical note in the inspection of the oral varicosities is that when we ask the patient to lift the tongue, sometimes the muscular pressure produces ischemia, hindering the proper visualization of the vessels in the undersurface of the tongue. Still, an evident asymmetry could be identified in this picture, with one side having more lesions. Could you identify which side of this particular picture have more varicosal lesions? Yes, you're right. This is the same patient as the, the first picture, but as you can see, this, uh, we asked the patient to lift the, the tongue upwards and then turn it to the left and then to the right. So that way, both sides of the tongue can be inspected separately. Compare the assessment of the tongue lifted, the first photo that we you can see here, with this side view of the left side. You can surely notice that in this side, more lesions can actually be seen now. So that is because when we the patient lift, lift the tongue, Sometimes the muscle pressure can produce ischemia and some viruses could be, could be a hindered for our vision. So this is the other side of the same patient. This is a grade one viruses. Again, because it only has OB on the ventral surface of the tongue. In this particular case, the biases extension was too large at her age. The patient was 45 years old. <coughs> so given that the patient did not present any risk factor for biases formation, she had no family history of biases, no low limb biases, etc. Her blood pressure was measured in the dental in, in our office. And it showed, showed high values, 82 and 147. Therefore, she was referred to a physician when, a proper, when after proper testing, the diagnosis of arterial hypertension was made. 
This patient was unaware of her disease. She didn't know she had arterial hypertension. And the diagnosis was made because the OB finding in the dentist's office, our office. You could be the one seeing this patient and maybe identifying a medical disorder unbeknown to the patient by properly looking at OB and making a good medical history. The second case, uh, in, the, in this one, we can identify the presence of sublingual varices and also OB on the floor of the mouth. Thus, having the ventral surface plus one side affected, this is a grade two varices. In the anamnesis, the patient related having a family history of varices and also she had lower limb varices herself. Here, the background was deeming enough to justify the presence of grade two varices, but in the age, blood pressure should be measured in, the, in cases such as this one anyway. Case three, here we have a case of a male of 50 years, 58 years old, suffering from a congestive heart failure. It is known that chronic elevation of right heart pressure could induce varices development, varices formation. And in this picture, we can see both the ventral surface and floor of the mouth having oral varicosities. This, this is the, another picture of the same patient. Here we can see that there is an oral varicosity in the buccal mucosa. So this is a grade three OB oral varicosity, which in this particular case correlates with the existing medical disorder. Since a uh, congestive heart failure are a serious, a really uh, debilitating medical disorder, the person, this particular patient was uh, aware of the existence of the disease, but uh, it would be indeed interesting, however, to see whether some initial case of congestive heart failure or right heart failure will actually develop OB before the onset of the general symptoms re related to this condition. All the individuals with right heart or congestive heart failure whom we observe and seen in our clinic have rather large and extensive oral vicosity. They all have grade three oral vicosities. So just uh, to be closing, I know that I maybe overextended myself a little too much. Uh, an oral idea proposed by a, a renowned oral pathologist um, called Bean, one of the first uh, studies about oral varicosities, uh, proposed in the closing argument of his very really interesting paper of 1952. He said that lesions in terms of significance are like Mark Twain's comment about the weather. Everyone, everyone talks about it, but no one does anything about it. You are in a position now, if, I, if you have understand just a little of what I just uh, show you, you are in a position to maybe understand better the possibility of of or the presence of oral varicosity could be a, a, an indicator of some hidden, some unknown medical condition for this patient. But again, please remember that it's not enough the identification of uh, oral varicosity. The appropriate medical record should be done stating, asking directly all the medical conditions that could be associated with the development of viruses throughout the whole body and in the oral cavity too. So, to be closing, thank you. Uh, oral viruses are common lesions. It's the all OB incidence increases with age. They could be used, they have, sorry, really particular and specific clinical features that we could use to define, to properly define its presence. When we say, remember when we, when the main trunk of the 
Renin vein has more than one trunk that which is exophy, which is exophytic. Mm? When we have the running veins being asymmetric, that is one side having more dilated or more size or more enlarged than the other. So they have a set of characteristics that we can use to properly define when a patient has an oral varicosity. Oral varicosity also could be used potentially as an early indicator of some systemic conditions. And in recent years, its association, particularly, particularly with arterial hypertension, has been given more attention with current research developing development uh, showing that uh, all oral varicosities values as a warning sign for systemic condition is important to be used in the general population. Also, nowadays, the available body of literature supports its use as a simple, cheap, accessible, and easy to use tool in health population screening. And more studies are being carried out to test new associations. Oral varicosities has a potential to uncover critical and sometimes unknown diseases in our patients. So be aware of its presence in your daily practice. Thank you. I will now be hearing your question and thank you again, Dr. Mandana and all of you for your attention. I will be here. So you have here my personal info. So if you wish to contact me or ask me any of the information of the studies uh, regarding oral varicosities. Thank you. That was a very nice lecture and very thorough. Thank you. So, <laughs> you're welcome. It was, it really was. So now we're going to wait for getting our questions. Uh, in the meanwhile, everybody who watched, if you liked it, please hit like. Uh, and if you are on LinkedIn, you can always, uh, you know, there are uh, reactions down at the bottom, so you can use those. Uh, so let's see while we get questions. Let's see who's been here. So we have had Dr. Juan with us. I don't know whether I am assuming Dr. Romero. Okay. <laughs> and we have. Had it's from Cordova. Saying it's safe. <laughs> okay. And then we have had Dr. Akshay with us. And. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Pavitra. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Hello, everyone. Dr. Vinay Hazare, good evening, sir. And we have a sort of a philosophical one from Dr. Madhav. <laughs> yes, yes. Health is the real wealth. <laughs> that is true. It Save is. Yes. time saves nine. Prevention is better than cure. Yes. We have also with us Dr. Subod. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Thank you for your kind work. Excellent presentation. We also have with us on LinkedIn, uh, Doctor Varun and Doctor Mohit Sharma and Doctor Abhishek. As it happens, we are not able to bring in the comments from LinkedIn. There is uh, no connection to this software from there. So, uh, anything, any questions you have there, please just put it in, and we shall. I shall read it. So this I, I will. I it. will um, uh, send you the a reference list of the papers that I use for this presentation. So if anyone is interested in reading them, uh, they they will have the reference. So yes, it is very useful. Also, if they want to conduct a study, because this is something we don't normally talk about. But it, it could really make a lot of difference. Well, all the people that I've, that I've talked to in the oral pathology conference, 
at, at this particular topic say the same thing. Uh, they all have seen it, have seen oral biases in their practice, but they really were, weren't sure about of this importance of this. So that's, um, I think this is a topic that nowadays is gaining traction because uh, there's been a lot of res recent works, uh, the work in Sweden by Dr. Hackenberg and Lena Hartung have been made some really tremendous work about it. So if you are interested in the topic and you have the time, I will send it the reference list to you so you can have it and give it a look maybe. That is very true, yeah, especially in today's time. And I think uh, from the last, uh, you know, the WHO, uh, mm -hmm. what is it called? The goals, the sustainable goals of development, where they have now included oral health as being yeah. an actual part of the overall health. And uh, so I think things like this are going to even add to that, uh, to the importance of what we can do on the oral and maxillofacial diagnostic site to add to not just oral health, but overall health. Yes, yes, that and the potential. And this is the key of a simple exam with yes. the same things that any any dentist have in their office to spot a potential systemic lesion that the patient, the patient may be unaware of it's really, really great. Still, there is a, a lot of uh, work to be done about it, but uh, it is really, truly, truly interesting, uh, the possibilities. Yes, very, this. very interesting. And there's a lot of possibility because after all, we get to see patients. I mean, if it's done the right way, we do tell everybody to come back for a checkup once a year. So we could be really the earliest uh, among the health workers to see something because it's just an incidental frightening probably before the patient even thinks of anything else or reaches anyone else and examining the mouth is so ever so easy yes, <laughs> compared it, to everything else <laughs> <laughs> yes so that just makes it too tempting really to I do hope people will go out and work on it so that we have the data that we need yes we have, we have one more, Dr. Pushpalata, who also says, thank you, thank you Dr. Thank you. Lazos. Really kind. Yes. My, so, my English, as you know, I, it is not as good as, as it should be, but I try my best. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Madan, again for the kind invitation and the <laughs> addition and the correction of the video that I sent you. <laughs> yes, you're, you're most welcome. Actually speaking, you know, I think... Uh, Language, yeah. uh, not the majority of the world is not English speaking, actually. Yes. <laughs> so language <laughs> is a problem. And I truly believe it should not be a limiting factor for us exchanging ideas. So it's still you can speak in English. So that really makes a lot of difference. But otherwise, unless we have interactions like this, we will never find what other parts of the world and others are doing. And the contribution is great. You were last time you were speaking, you were telling me about the meeting in uh, Brazil, where yes, yes, thousand yes. Uh, oral pathology and oral medicine it, got it together. Was, it was almost well, one thousand oral pathology and oral medicine specialists from Brazil and some other parts of uh, South America. It was huge. Brazil is the country who has almost the half of the dentist population of the world. It's it's insane. I've never been to a scientific meeting about oral medicine or oral pathology as big as this one. It was awesome. We have some very good friends in Brazil who organized that. And the next lecture on this channel uh, has uh, Professor Jose Menavar, who is going to talk about burning mouth syndrome. He is awesome. I thoroughly recommend it to hear his lecture. Yes, I think his lecture is on the 3rd of October. But oh, it is already, oh, it's already, <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's already, uh, actually you got confused because it's already posted on the YouTube and on the website. It's yes, already indeed. there as upcoming events, yes. 
I that would be, be also very interesting, yes. Because yes. Uh, again, burning mouth syndrome, one of those things that has a lot of, uh, it, it's very troublesome for the patient who is suffering from it. And we have so little to do. It's one of the most challenging uh, diseases to conditions to treat in oral medicine. Yes, um, I would say it's um, even the, the top three. Uh, because the patients have some a real discomfort and they are usually mistreated by the professionals they, they seek help about. And even professionals who can actually know the this condition is really hard because it has it can have a lot of different variables taken into account, but yes, yes, it's it's challenging. It's really hard. Very challenging, yes. So I don't think we don't have any more questions. It, it was all real clear. Or, or <laughs> they are maybe all sleep. Yes, the detail <laughs> was rather complete. <laughs> so let me just remind everyone that if they are interested, uh, Dr. Hieronimo was with us earlier. This is a chronic mechanical irritation. As you can see, he picks up interesting topics that are not otherwise covered. I if you if you if you want i i there has been some really uh, great uh, new papers about this particular topic uh, so maybe we can do an update if you are interested yes, i have definitely we can do an update very interesting work about it yes to show you because this is this is like. also a very interesting topic and on that day we also had a very good uh, summary by dr tilakrat at that time Yes, 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 and that whole interaction is available on our YouTube channel. I will put the link in the description below the channel, so uh, below mm -hmm. the video, so you can all watch it. And yes, it is one of those things because I guess as dentists, you know, the main thing on our mind is always sharp teeth and or prosthesis for that matter. Those two <laughs> irritations and we are, it's, it's just too important and it's just too much there and we have still not got sufficient proof so we all well, doubt it but nowadays the, the proof is the, the evidence uh, studying the association of, with uh, of chronic mechanical rotation and oral cancer is increasing and it's getting just there just and there, yes. we, we uh, in our oral medicine department we always say our student that's this is one key aspect for whole dentistry. Uh, there are some things that, of uh, uh, as an example of arterial hypertension and some diseases that can should be referred to the, to a physician. But the management, identification, and prevention of chronic mechanical irritation is in the hands of the dentist and the dentist alone. No other profession can do anything to actually see that and treat it. So the role of the dentist could not be overemphasized to prevent these conditions that could be caused or modified by chronic mechanic irritation. Sorry, I understand myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. I, 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 know you, <laughs> I mean, when you spoke to us, it was that you had already been working on this for 25 years. So I suppose now it is 26 years. So I can understand that it is something you really are very dedicated to. <laughs> yes, and you can have this back to, you know, the uh, back uh, meet again to have a follow up with that. We have yes, one please. comment from Dr. Subod. Dr. Yoita P has published an excellent paper on chronic mechanical irritation. Well, we, 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 yes, yes, we have uh, talked with him actually well, by email and we have uh, both of the, the articles, he has three, but we have both uh, two of the articles quoted in our uh, pro, uh, research, our, our the research of our group. Yes, yes, it's, it's really interesting. Yes, in that, in the presentation that Dr. Mandana is linking right now, I'm, I'm actually uh, mentioning one of the articles by him, by the group, yes. I mean. <laughs> it's, it's such a wonderful thing that we can so easily link with people from around the world now. Yes, <laughs> and it, it's a small it's, world. 
Yes, it still blows my mind. I mean, the the meeting that you organized, the con case conference last year was amazing. There was so many people from all around the world. All over the world, yes. United by the passion of, of outdoor medicine. The work that you have, that you are doing, Madana, and you keep doing is really awesome to promote oral medicine and oral pathology. You are really, you. really, really doing something great and long lasting. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all the help I get from you. <laughs> yes, I'm knowing that I can always depend on you helps. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so going on to giving you your certificate. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you. <laughs> no. thank you. Thanks to you. Yes. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this, this space. <laughs> so anytime you want to have me, I will be here. <laughs> Wonderful. I always love to hear that. Yes. <laughs> okay, with no more further comments anywhere. We are almost done. So I just have to say that next week we are going to talk about something different, the need for empathy in diagnostics. I know very often we may think that diagnostics, I mean, whether we are taking an x-ray or we're just having a look, uh, does it really need empathy? Are we really troubling the patient? So I think we're just taking another look at empathy and the way that it's needed because diagnostics are often the very first step of interaction patients have with the healthcare they workers. They are. Yes, so I think we can show the required empathy. And for that, we need to first know that it is required. Then I'm sure we will all show it. So that is going to be our next week. And I certainly hope you will be all with us. With that, yes, we are ready for the bye-bye tune. So, thank you, Dr. Okay. Hieronimo. See you soon. Oh, thank, you. thank you again, Manana, for having me. It, thank you. Thank it is you. great. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye-bye.